Welcome to the Roundtable Perspective. I'm your host, Lee Arts. I'm joined today by my guest, Stansfield Smith, who participated in delegations to observe the elections in Nicaragua and Venezuela, which we will be talking about today. Thank you, Stansfield, for joining me today. Um, Stan Smith is a longtime contributor to the Alliance for Global Justice, AFGA. He's currently the publisher of their Venezuela News and ALBA News, which is the Bolivarian Alliance of Our America, which is a collaborative project of 10 nations, including Venezuela, Bolivia, Nicaragua, the Dominica, Antigua, and others. Stan has been an election observer in Latin America for many years, and most recently he went with delegations to observe preparations for the elections in Nicaragua and observe the election in Venezuela. Today we want to discuss his experience and try to make sense of the contradictory accounts that we see in the leading U.S. media. Uh, my understanding is that there's been more than 25 elections in the last 20 years in Venezuela, uh, both national, municipal, presidential. And in the recent election, November 21st, the PSUV, the Socialist Party of Venezuela, won um, 20 governor elections and the opposition parties won three. Um, also, the Democratic Alliance and the, the MUD, the Unity Roundtable, um, won 96 mayoral positions. Um, but the U.S. media claims the elections were not democratic, which kind of would baffle somebody when you see those actual numbers. Um, they said only 42% voted. Um, so you were there during this process, um, leading up to and at the elections, and I thought, Maybe you can just share with us what some of the things were that the delegation you were part of found in witnessing the elections. Well, I could say um, there was anybody could go to vote, and it was a very orderly process. You, you voted electronically, and you made a paper copy, and it was all recorded, and there were, what, 300 and some international observers uh, there observing the election, even the European Union, which had gone there for the first time in many years. Well, one of the, is, one of the, when you read closely the way that the New York Times framed it or the Wall Street Journal framed it, they gave the impression for the American reader, or if you were to watch the limited coverage that you could see on network TV, it was framed as if there were um, government uh, uh, armed government agents that were walking around that were preventing people from campaigning, talking, even intimidating people at the polls. Um, that's part of the, that's part of the lack of fairness and openness in the elections. So, and not having been there, what's an American reader or viewer to think? <laughs> well, the interesting thing would be if the Venezuelan election was fixed the part that's the Chavista parties, which is a it wasn't just a PSUV, but a several different parties together in a block. They only got 47 percent of the vote. So if they had fixed the election, how why did they get a minority <laughs> of the vote? <laughs> and if it wasn't free and fair, or people couldn't vote how they wanted, then why did they get a minority? The opposition parties got more percent of the vote, but they were all divided and fighting oh, with each other. It was divided yeah. among several, several parties, so even though they're, the majority of people may have voted for one of these Yeah, I think there was three or four. Yeah, there were several, several parties that were on the ballot. So I did read this article when I came back here about from the New York Times. It starts off with the election saying, European observers said the elections were neither free nor fair, which there was a European electoral observation mission. That's the beginning of the article. But this is just false. They didn't say that. Remember, they, they, what they said was, the Venezuelan electoral legal framework complies with the most basic international electoral standards. That's a statement from the European Union. So uh, you're saying the lead from the New York Times is not accurate, right, even based right. upon what they quote down farther in the article. And they even further in the article, yeah, they said they didn't 
Well, there was an article in the, in, I read in Fairness and Accuracy in the Media, which is fair.org, which said he was in the same meeting where the reporters asked the European Union representatives if the elections were free and fair, and they would not answer that question. They wouldn't say it was, and they wouldn't say it wasn't. So to say that they said they were not free and fair, they explicitly did not say that. They didn't take a position on that at that time. Yeah. This is a New York Times, which is considered the so-called newspaper of record. Well, I, I happen to remember that the New York Times was one of the first newspapers in the world that recognized the coup that overthrew the elected Chavez government uh, uh, yes. about 20, 20 years ago because they said this would be an advance for democracy to remove the president that had been elected. Uh, my, my question is, how, do we, how have we gotten to that point such that the uh, I, I'm not asking you to become a media analysis, but how have we gotten to the point where um, U.S. politicians, both Democratic and Republican, and the U.S. media seem to follow in, in, uh, in the same frame? I mean, I know it was Obama that 2014, 2015, somewhere in there, decided that Venezuela was a threat to the United States and put it on a watch list, and then Trump followed that, and uh, I believe Biden has maintained that as well. Mm -hmm. they, they recognized uh, the fellow called Guaido, who was not elected to any post, but they recognized him as the president of Venezuela without having an election. Right. Even though the majority of, overwhelming majority of Venezuelans didn't even know his name. Right. My question is, how have we gotten to that point? This seems, I mean, it's almost, I know we live in an era where that's called fake news, but how is it possible to get to the point where you go and see a fair election or open access and multiple parties running and uh, other election observers from around the world see that, but we don't see that in the in reports to us, to American citizens? It's, I think the media in this country has just become an, a tool of the, uh, you want to call it the national security state to keep people well, on this. Well, if you're a good journalist, your primary task is to uh, give the proper quotes and to uh, uh, report things objectively. So if, if you're getting the quote from this particular source, as long as you're uh, transcribing it accurately, like a secretary, you pretty much have done your job. So without um, asking the media to do more than it does except to report on the official spokespeople and what they're presenting, um, it may skew what we see, but um, it's not largely removed from what the actual political relations are between the U.S. and Venezuela or the U.S. and Nicaragua or the U.S. and any other um, country. You might, you might say if the U.S. government has a, a negative attitude towards country X, the U.S. media will report that there is a negative attitude towards country X. It's, uh, it's almost, it's, it, you can almost assume that. My question would be that it seems when they talk about the problems in Venezuela today, they're laid at the foot of Chavez or Maduro or the attempt to build socialism and Right. There is no mention of uh, the sanctions or the freezing of accounts or the, the, the blockade of medicine that could be sent to, to uh, Venezuela or the, even the export of oil. That just does not appear. So it's not so much what is reported is not true. It's that there's a whole bunch of information that exists that is just not reported. Right. Yes, the U.S media doesn't talk about the sanctions, not on Cuba, not on Venezuela. They don't mention that there have been studies by the United Nations Human Rights Rapporteurs that these U.S. sanctions, European Union and Can Canadian sanctions on Venezuela kill about 40,000 Venezuelans a year because they don't get medicine and they, you, there's not enough fuel to get to the hospitals on time if they live out in the country and they the people who have diabetes need to get get to the machines and they are not able to go in somewhere to get on one of those dialysis machines and they die 
it's been like 40, when did ever the sanctions started, especially under Trump, they got worse. But um, yes, it kills about 40,000 a year in that country. And have I think their have gross the, national product has gone. Have the sanctions been ended by the Biden administration? No, okay. Biden it continues all the sanctions on all these countries. Every year, every year they renew it. And what they renew is this statement that says, they say it about Venezuela, they say it about Nicaragua, and they say it about Cuba, that the country constitutes an unusual and extraordinary threat to the national security and foreign policy of the United States. And the president there hereby declares a national emergency to deal with the threat. So I don't know if people think what's what's the national emergency in this country from the threat from Nicaragua or Venezuela? It's the import of sugar. We, we, we have too much sugar in our diet, and it's a... <laughs> <laughs> and not only that, they have to, he has to renew this every year. And like, this Congress asks, like, is what's the evidence of any of this? Like, what is the threat? What happened? What have they been doing? Is this like, no, even the media, what is, what's, the, what's the threat? What's the extraordinary threat that these countries pose? What's happened to us here in this country? They don't, it's not, they just say these things and there's no questioning of it. Let, let's turn to Nicaragua, um, maybe f to a amplify what you observed in Venezuela. I know you were in Nicaragua a month before the elections. So you didn't, you weren't there actually on the day the elections were held, but you were there in the lead up to it. Um, again, one of the things that is suggested from uh, the media coverage, the network news and most of the major print media, is that, uh, well, what the U.S. and the EU and the Organization for American States said was a sham election. Mm -hmm. That there was um, jailing of uh, candidates. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously, if I have somebody running against me and I put him in jail, I can't, you know, it's not an election. So what, what did you see the month that you were there before uh, the elections happened? Were that, was there a restriction on, I mean, were candidates jailed? Were they rounded up, denied the right to be on the ballot? Well, these were never actually candidates. The U.S. calls them candidates, or maybe they call them pre-candidates, which anybody is a pre-candidate, because I, that, what, I don't know what that means. But these people were jailed for taking money from the United States government to organize uh, violent protests against the government like they did in uh, 2018. Now, if any of us took money from Russia or China to organize violent protests in the United States, and we were gonna run for an elected office, using that money, you can be sure that we would be put in prison also. So, but... Uh, so does this mean there weren't any candidates that ran against Yeah, there Ortega? was like five or six different candidates. In both elections, there were like five or six different candidates, five or six different parties. Yes, and in Nicaragua, I think there were uh, six. One regional party, because there's one part of uh, Nicaragua where the indigenous areas, it's completely autonomous. They have their own parties. Um, I could also say, getting back to Venezuela, we had a meeting with opposition politicians there, and they had said that, one of them said that the elections this year in Venezuela were the, the freest elections Venezuela's had in 20 years. So that's, clearly they don't agree with the, the U.S. on these elections. So in uh, Venezuela, if I have this right, about two-thirds of the national and municipal elections were won by that coalition that's around the, the Maduro forces. Um, and that means that there were, as I said, uh, 96 mayoral positions. In Nicaragua, that's a similar number. Ortega got 75% of the vote, or the FSLN, the Sandinista party, mm -hmm. got 75%, and the Constitutional Liberal Party got about 15%, and they also had similar numbers in the National Assembly. So my question would be, um, 
how, how, does this, how does this compute when you say the elections are a sham? If there are five parties running officials and one of the, one of the parties got as much as 15% of the vote and they have 20% of the seats in the National Assembly, um, how, how does that fit with the idea that this is a sham election? Uh, well, I can't really say how the U.S. makes this stuff up. They just said this beforehand, that it was a sham election. Well, Even well, before the election happened, it was a sham. That's what they, basically they said in Venezuela also. Well, this goes back to the 2018, 2019, 2020 protests where there were large numbers of students and others that were protesting the Ortega regime and demanding uh, an end to the social security reforms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, we, we, we saw that on the nightly news. So, I mean, if you're, if you're doing some background to it, arguably somebody could say, well, look, these protests were put down. These protests demonstrate there's an authoritarian regime. So to hold elections under these conditions is a sham. I'm not sure who was involved in those protests, if they were, what extent they were students or whoever they were, but I know what there was, 300 or some people killed? I forget exactly how many, but the majority of the people killed were government supporters. So obviously there was more violence on the, uh, the protester side than on the government side. Even I know the we went to Nicaraguan police station and they talked, because they were under siege for like a month. And they said the Nicaraguan government had to told the police to stay in their police stations and not to leave these protesters alone. So a lot of people who were killed were killed by people who had set up blockades to protesting the government. They would kill Sandinista supporters. They killed government officials. They killed uh, government police. Um, were people charged with that? I mean, were these some of the... They were charged pre, and then they were said, if we'll forgive you and let you out of prison, but if you ever uh, do this type of thing again, you will get charged for what you did in 2018 and what you're doing again now. And that's why some of these people who are said are candidates are in prison because they were trying to do the same thing again this year. Um, but I think if you look at all the social gains that Nicaragua has made under the Sandinista government, it's pretty obvious that they're going to win an election. Well, the, 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 even the paper reported that 67% uh, of eligible voters in Nicaragua voted, and out of those 67%, three-fourths of them voted for the Sandinistas. Right. And you're saying it's because there's been... Uh, social programs that have benefited the population? Because if oh, you're yeah. saying we have an authoritarian regime or we have a dictatorial regime, it would seem like there would be less participation. People would just stay home, shut their doors, not wanting to participate. The, w what would be some of the things that might explain why this large number of people <laughs> went to the polls despite the protests or uh, in contradiction to the protests? Well, the, Nicaragua, like Venezuela, and like Cuba have things that we do not have here, but they take it for granted there now that they have free health care for everybody. They have, I'm not sure if all th countries have free medicine. They have free education through college, and they have Venezuela has made uh, 3.8 million homes for families in Venezuela in the last 10 years, which, you know, that's like four people in a family. That's like uh, almost half the population has got a new home, which they don't really pay for unless they're like certain, above a certain income level. Nicaragua has done the same sort of thing. They've vastly increased uh, the water for people, the water in your homes, sewage, electricity for homes. I mean, Nicaragua is the third poorest country in, in Latin America. They have school lunches for all the kids so they can go to, they don't have to worry about going to school hungry. They have even established 
child care centers all over the country for everybody for free which is something you know we can dream about here they have more women in the government than they in government ministers there's more women than men there they even have like women's police stations established around the country so if you're a woman that's victim of domestic violence or any other kind of sexual violence there's a women's police you can go to because I know women don't want to go to men police because they don't really get that much attention here. They also have established women's shelters so that if uh, women are abused at home, they can go to shelters. Some would respond. In fact, uh, some editorials in the Wall Street Journal have responded. This is evidence that Ortega and Murillo, the vice president, are buying votes with these programs. We're going to have these programs the same thing has been said about uh, Venezuela. You, you give people a new home and you provide them with free education and that's just a way of getting, uh, getting their support. Well, I could say we met with a lot of government ministers when we were there in October and I can't really say that the people were saying that Daniel Ortega did these things for us. They always say like, we have done these things. So it's like Daniel Ortega is the leader, but it was like he's giving the people the initiative to go ahead and help build a better society for yourselves. And you decide what you want and we'll help support doing it. We, we, we don't have a lot of time. The last thing that I wanted to ask you was, um, Aren't, aren't we in a different era? I mean, we know the era of U.S. Uh, invasion and occupation in Latin America from Guatemala to Cuba to Nicaragua and supporting coups in Brazil and Chile. And, but all that's gone because now we have a liberal Democrat in office and we're, we're moving forward and now the U.S. is interested in humanitarian aid and democracy in the hemisphere. What would, I mean... What would you say to that? Well, I would say I was even surprised how, how many coups and attempted coups that the United States has tried to organize in Latin America to stop these countries from taking a path that's independent of U.S. control. They had 2002, they had a coup in Venezuela. 2003, the U.S. tried a coup in Cuba. 2004, they had a coup in Haiti. 2008, they tried a coup in Bolivia. 2009, they had a coup in Honduras, which finally been overturned. 2010, the U.S. tried a coup in Ecuador. 2012, U.S. tried a coup in Paraguay. Well, they succeeded in a coup in Paraguay. 2013, the U.S. Tr tried a coup in Venezuela. 2015, the U.S. tried another coup in Ecuador. 2016, they had a lawfare coup in Brazil. 2017, the U.S. tried another coup in Venezuela. 2018, the U.S. tried a coup in Nicaragua. 2019, U.S. tried a coup again in Venezuela and succeeded for a year in a coup in Bolivia. And again this year, the U.S. tried a coup in Cuba. So this is like almost every year that U.S. is constantly interfering in these countries in Latin America, giving them the right to decide for themselves and build their own futures independent of U.S. control. Whenever there's a government that comes in that tries to um, put their own people first and not the U.S. first, the U.S. is always going to say that it's authoritarian, it's anti-democratic, and the U.S. needs to intervene to restore democracy to the country. So the attempt to uh, have democracy in the hemisphere, um, if we're to accept what you said, suggests that the democracy should begin in this country. Uh, <laughs> we, could, we could talk about this more. Um, thank you, Stansfield Smith, for uh, joining me. Well, thank you for having um, me here. And speaking with our audience, we, as I said, we could uh, talk longer, and maybe we can have you back um, in the near, near future to talk about the other elections in Latin America. But that's all the time we have now. Um, thank you, Stan Smith, and thank you, audience, for joining me today on
Roundtable Perspective. I'm Lee Arts. I'll see you next time.